I will call to order this November meeting of the Bloomington Board of Park Commissioners. And Kim, could we start with the roll call, please? Yes, Kathleen Mills. Here. Ellen Rodkey. Here. Israel Herrera. Here. And Jim Whitlatch. Here. Thank you. Okay, and then we'll start off with um, our consent calendar the minutes and claims from the last meeting, and then also some smaller items, service, a couple of service agreements and three smaller uh, contracts that we've all had a chance to look at for the last couple of days already. So do we have a motion to approve the consent calendar? I'll move to approve. I'll second. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. I think we do a roll call, aren't we? Oh, whoops, you're right, sorry. <laughs> yes, roll <Sorry>. call. <laughs> Kathleen Mills. Aye. Ellen Rodkey. Aye. Israel Herrera. Aye. And Jim Whitlatch. Aye. Okay, there we go. All right, so motion unanimously carried. And next we will move <clears throat> into our section B for staff introductions and we will get to meet Jalen Banneker Community Center Program Specialist. I think Jalen's there, I think I saw. I think I saw Jalen Bernie's name on the- hey, Yes, Hello. she- Oh, there we go. Yeah, I keep trying to um, start my video, but it won't let me. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's- Sorry, Jalen, try now. Oh, oh, okay. Let me see. Hello? Oh, oh I think it worked. <laughs> yes, yeah, sorry, I look like I'm in the studio right now because I definitely am. <laughs> but hello, everyone. Nice to meet you. My name is Jalen. Did you want me to introduce myself now? Sorry, my sound was. Oh, yes. Out. Sorry. Yeah, please go ahead. Tell us a little bit about yourself and what you'd like to do there at. The Banneker Center. Oh, perfect. Well, my name is Jalen. And first, I'd like to say that I'm excited to be a part of the City of Bloomington and Recreation Department as the program specialist at Banneker Community Center. I'm from Fort Wayne, Indiana. I moved to Bloomington the summer of 2018 to start my degree, where this summer I will graduate majoring in sociology and African American studies. For the past four years, I've been working as the advocate for community engagement at Templeton Elementary in Bloomington, where I'm the liaison between the university and the school creating community service partnerships. And I started working at Banneker last fall and last spring, I then became the teen specialist. So I handled the day-to-day -day of the teen program and now I am the program specialist. Um, again, I'm just grateful to be here and to work with you all, and I'm excited. All right, great. It's, good. it's great to meet you, Jalen. Welcome to the Parks Department. Thank you. All right, and then moving on into our Section C, other business. First up, um, Aaron Hatch is going to tell us about um, a tree, removal of a tree a tree appeal for removal of some trees in Bryan Park. Hello, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, essentially, there are six Bradford pears that have been posted for removal um, along the northeast uh, section of Bryan Park. Uh, these are directly adjacent to the tennis courts. Um, these have been posted as an appealable removal um, essentially because we're trying to pair both needs for uh, the Bryan Park perimeter path project and reducing invasive trees within Bryan Park. Um, these trees are relatively small um, and they're the only six Bradford pears located in Bryan Park. Um, while we don't systematically go removing pears, this is kind of a win-win where not only does it make uh, the perimeter path project easier, but we're also eradicating those pears that are in Bryan Park. 
Um, and essentially, I'd like to recommend that we are able to continue with the removal and thereby deny the appeal that is being presented tonight um, and allow for removal of these six Bradford pear trees to, to go on. Okay. All right. Thank you, Aaron. Um, and I don't know if we have Stephanie Stewart on the meeting to talk about her appeal. We have a written copy of it, if not. I know she said she was planning on being present, but I'm not seeing her currently. Okay. All right. Um, I guess I would just start by, I just went over to look at the area the other day and I was surprised that the pear trees had not caused more damage to the path because it's a very tiny area. There's the fence, the trees and the path. And I don't know if they, is one of the, I mean, I know they're invasive species, but also as a concern that is, the path is going to get a little wider and come around there and there's just not going to be any room for them or? Um, it's more a matter of if we're going to be doing this perimeter work, there's a chance that these trees will be damaged in, in the uh, process. But additionally, it's a chance for us to remove these pears as part of this project. Right. Okay. And they, because they are invasive. Yes. Yes. Even though they flower in a lovely way in the spring. So. Uh, okay, are there any questions or comments from other board members? I will add just maybe yes. a few things. Um, in, in this Bryan Park Perimeter Path project, one of the main concerns was actually tree protection and uh, designing around the trees. So while these six are being removed, there's portion of this path projects that are going to be overlaid and also boardwalked um, in order to allow for protection of tree roots but these bring Bradford pears, that's essentially why we're, we're looking to remove them. Okay, all right. Okay, thank you, Aaron. Any questions or comments for Aaron? I've got a question, Aaron. Are in the plans for the new path, are there any trees planned or what's the landscaping for that area for the new path if these trees are removed? So we don't have any planting plans directly tied to the Bryan Park Perimeter Path project, but we do hope to plant more trees and replant some trees that are being removed either to replace, say, these Bradford pears, but there are some uh, trees identified as hazardous um, that we'd like to remove as part of it, but the planting wouldn't necessarily be included as part of this project, just general planting that we do in the park. And if these trees aren't removed now, would they, are they going to be damaged by the new path or could the new path go in and not damage these trees? Um, so the new path could go in and not damage the trees, but it would make work easier if we were able to have the trees removed. Okay, my last question is, um, Give me 30 seconds on why Bradford pears are bad. I mean, I've seen that. I know that they get wind damaged easily. Uh, I guess I'm not sure what else. I know they're, I know they're non-native and all that, but tell me why uh, Bradford pear trees are not, are a concern as an invasive species. Well, I'll give you two answers. One is the concern as the invasive species, but other is the concern from uh, just having this type of tree from a safety perspective. Um, the main issue when it comes to Bradford pears in areas like this is that over time, they may eventually have poor uh, branching and poor form. And so if we're able to remove them before it comes to that, that's a, a, an advantage to us um, as the kind of park main, maintainers. Um, additionally, they do spread very easily, and it's something that we have to fight in our more naturalized areas. Um, the pear being in Brine Park means that if they spread, that's another invasive that we have to manage as part of Brine Park invasive management. Um, but they're just really pervasive in terms of how quickly they spread. And this is an area in which they're not as confined, and so they could spread more easily. And additionally, uh, you know, we do have a chance to plant other trees as replacements in these areas, unlike, say, along our street where we might be a little bit harder pressed to find species that can work there. 
two quick follow-ups to that. When you say the branches don't, do you mean that this and the safety issue, does, are you saying that as these get older, that the branches be, uh, come, become susceptible to breaking and falling off and maybe injuring somebody in the street or injuring somebody on the walk, or is it something other than that is one question. And then my second question is how do they spread? Do the roots spread or do they have a, some kind of seed or something that is easily spread? Uh, the latter rather than the roots. Um, and then just inherent to this type of tree, they have uh, kind of tight branching um, and these branches tend to be of equal size, which are things that make a failure more likely to occur. It's essentially known as codominant branching when you have branches that are kind of of equal size of the stem. And oftentimes there's other underlying things that make it prone to failures, failures such as included bark. And the way in which these branch unions are, where they're very tight and clustered around the tree, also makes this type of tree more prone to failure. Um, so it's not a great tree as it gets older. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Or Kathleen? Comments? Yes. I, I'd like to give everybody an opportunity to raise their hand if they would like to make a comment. And sure. we do okay. have, we had someone on here by iPhone. I want to see if they're still here and give them the opportunity to identify themselves. And I don't see them on here any longer. So if anybody would like to else would like to make a comment, please raise your hand now. Um, Aaron, I, I guess I understand your reasons. I feel a little conflicted in that whenever people talk about removing trees and they know you can always plant new trees. But when I look at the size of those and the bench under it and the number of people I see sitting there in the shade, taking a break from tennis or watching people on the tennis courts. I mean, obviously it would be, I mean, it would be decades before any tree grew over there that could provide any similar sort of shade canopy. Is that pretty much the situation? So I would say truthfully with that space allowable, it would be smaller canopy trees that could go in in the grander scheme of Bryan Park, we can replant uh, trees within the park on the larger scale. In those individual spots, we'd likely have to plant smaller stature species. And yes, you are talking about a 10 or so year time span uh, before those really reach any sort of shade capacity. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, so the recommendation is to deny the tree. Uh, the removal, deny the appeal of the removal of the six Bradford pear trees. So I think if there aren't any other questions or comments, we'll go ahead and take um, a roll call vote. I think, I think Israel had a comment. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Israel. Right. So how was how was this uh, uh, detected? Uh, how can we make sure that it's a uh, uh, a very strong potential. Um, uh, it would have a strong potential effect on 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 people walking around or or, or the surrounding areas. Um, can you maybe repeat your question? Because I'm not sure if you're saying you know what the impact on, the on people surrounding areas if we were to lose those trees or what exactly right. are you asking? The first, the first question is, uh, when was or how was this detected? Like uh, it, it was uh, assessed as a, as, a, as a potential risk for the area. The second one is uh, how strong would be the impact with people or, or the surrounding places that uh, we can think that it will damage totally the, the space. So these trees were selected for removal uh, we evaluated plans for the Bryan Park perimeter path. And so in evaluating those plans on how best to manage protection of other trees, we also had to look at trees that maybe should not remain with the damage that could occur from doing a pathway project. And those included some trees that are 
already maybe not in the greatest health, or in this case, trees that uh, we would like to remove due to the species itself, due to it being invasive, and due to knowing that there is long, uh, as the tree gets older, there is an increased chance of it having poor form and being something that might break in a storm. So as it stands, I would not classify these trees as being a, a hazard tree or anything like that. But just we know as these trees get older, they are prone to having the poor branching. And we know that they're uh, invasive that we are fighting throughout uh, the city of Bloomington. But these were identified to be included as part of the Bryan Park Perimeter Path Project. Um, when we were both looking at tree protection, but also trees that would be in conflict with the project as well. And these are the only ones besides two trees that have uh, existing condition issues that are being identified for removals. And the other sense they are classified as hazards are non-appealable. And then the second question about uh, the impact to the neighbors, I would say that the impact more has to do with having a path project that is free of cracks and maybe a safer path uh, to walk on versus maybe the shade that's, in my opinion, minimal that's provided by these smaller stature trees. And, and Aaron and, and Park Board, hello, Tim Street Operations Director. I can speak on the the project side of things a bit more as well. Um, since we've been planning this project, a big part of the perimeter trail project has been, how do we balance making trail improvements um, that preserve existing trees and that take the long-term holistic health of the trees into account? And so with the budget, with that project, what we've tried to do is preserve trees whenever, wherever possible. Um, at times we are replacing some of the path with boardwalk to preserve root systems. Um, we are rerouting a section of the path away from some large healthy native trees. Um, and in this section, as Kathleen noted, you know, it is particularly narrow. Um, and as we saw, you know, a few weeks ago when we had a special session, you know, the wrong tree planted in the wrong spot can create some other long-term issues like sidewalk heaving and more cracks and things like that. So as Aaron mentioned, you know, it's not necessarily part of the Bryan Park perimeter trail project, but we're doing this in tandem with it because we're going through there, we're going to be tearing up, we're going to be milling, we're going to be doing potential damage to our root system. So it's an opportune time for us to look at these invasive species, which, you know, at one point decades ago were thought to be sterile. Um, they were thought to be the perfect tree, but, um, you know, to quote Jeff Goldblum in Jurassic Park, life finds a way. Um, and they now breed prolifically and, and spread everywhere. So. Um, in addition to the hazards that Aaron mentioned, we thought it was an opportune time to take these ones out. Of course, you know, this is an issue we're facing a lot of places because these were thought to be sterile. They were planted a lot of places. We, we have a lot of stock of Bradford pears and moving forward, we're going to have to balance, you know, the benefits of, yes, they are mature trees um, with a slow program to, to replace and reinstall natives like red buds and dogwoods or smaller stature things in spaces like this where space is limited. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Tim. Um, are there any other questions for Tim or Aaron? So, so the need or, or the assessment is all six uh, trees. Yes, this is for all six of those trees. Okay. Um, any, I move, yes. I move that we uh, accept the recommendation and deny the appeal. Okay. And then could we have a roll call vote, please, Kim? Kathleen Mills. Aye. Ellen Rodkey. Aye. Israel Herrera. And Jim Whitlatch. And did we have a second on that? I'm sorry. I was going to say I'll second. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And I'm an I as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, motion is passed unanimously. Thank you, Aaron and Tim. Um, and 
Next up, Barb Dunbar will tell us about the contracts with Miracle for the Waldron Hill and Buzzkirk Park Playground, which has been torn up and awaiting new yes. stuff for quite Hi. a while. Good afternoon. Yeah. Good afternoon, Barb Dunbar, operations coordinator. Um, everybody can hear me, hear me okay, I assume. So staff recommends approval of a contract with Miracle Recreation Equipment Company for the procurement and installation of play equipment and port in place rubber safety servicing at the Waldron Hill and Buskirk Park Playground. Um, this report's kind of lengthy, so um, I just want to make sure you have all the background information here. I'll just go ahead and continue to kind of read it. The former playground at this location was installed in 2011 through Kaboom. The Kaboom program is a grant program which brings together community partners to, com to complete a, a build of a new playground. In this case, IU Health, the Project School, and Bloomington Parks and Recreation Department partnered to construct a new playground. 10 years passed and the Hidden River Pathway Project gets underway. And unfortunately, the Waldron Hill and Buskirk Park Playground is right in the path of the reconstruction of the downtown stormwater infrastructure plan. So in 2020, the Parks Department and the Bloomington City Utilities agree upon a set amount that will be reimbursed by CBU for the replacement of a new playground. That amount is $160,000. Additional funds of 93,582 become available through the GEO bond, allowing the department to increase the footprint of the play space, move from an engineered wood five bar surfacing to a rubber safety surfacing, add more swings, benches, and picnic tables, and, and contract out all of the installation. The selection process that the department utilized uh, was the request for proposal method for the procurement and installation of this new playground equipment and surfacing for this project. A legal ad was placed and published with two print dates providing notification and RFP packets were posted on the bloomingtonplanroom.com site. Email notification was then sent to 15 playground vendors directing them to that plan room site. The RFP specifies design preferences, standards and guidelines, safety and warranty requirements, accessibility and age use requirements, and equipment and material specifications and preferences. A site plan de designating the space allocation for each area was also provided. Play equipment components and the arrangement of those components are left to the expertise of the play equipment companies and are submitted for our review. The RFP process allows us to consider a variety of factors such as price, integration of play events, appearance, aesthetics, and general fun factor. And consequently, the process then is not a low quote wins. Each submittal received was, is thoroughly evaluated by a team of four department staff. A weighted evaluation criterion is utilized to assist in the determination of purchase recommendations. Proposals are evaluated using five weighted factors. Uh, aesthetics and appearance, play value, universal and accessible components, how the design addresses our guidelines and specs, and the cost quality and delivery. Prior to release of the RFP, three groups were identified as key players in, in seeking public input for the design of the new playground. These included the Boys and Girls Club of Bloomington, the Project School, and Kid City Break Days participants. Well, our kid city itself. Children were asked to rank nine separate play elements with one being their favorite and nine their least. Those results were then included in the RFP. In addition to collecting input from the children, the department also sought input via an online dot form in which 81 family responses were received. Those results were also included in the RFP. Seven vendors submitted proposals for this project for a total of 10 designs. Two vendors submitted multiple designs. All equipment, all play equipment and rubber safety surfacing will be installed by the vendor. Construction is expected to begin in the spring of 2022. The total project cost, um, well, the project cost for this contract would be 449960 the funding sources would be um, the 93,582.90 from the GEO bond and the 160 that we would be getting from CBU. Park board approval today then is for the full contract amount of the 44,993.60. So Kim is showing you some pictures. These are not, um, don't focus on these colors. These will not be the colors. In fact, I just met 
this afternoon with a couple reps from Miracle Company and we finalized colors, but it was too late to get, the, get it on this. So um, just look at the play equipment and the layout and the types of features that we have. Um, the colors, like I said, these are not the colors. The playground, as you can see, has a very universal design. That's what we really liked about this. It incorporates a 12 foot mega tower serving five to 12 year olds. And then it also has a tot structure that serves the two to five year olds. On that photo, it's on the bottom right corner there. Um, it also incorporates something fairly new to the industry that Miracle has called these museum pieces that provide a variety of sensory play. They have a, it also has a spinner um, in the back, background there. Yep, right there. Thank you, Kim. Um, that has a spinner that's in, designed for inclusive play. And it has a net climber over here on the far right side, a net climber, a very unique design that um, provides levitating rope play while enabling uh, greater visibility. The unique about the, the thing I really like about this net climber is it has the net climber itself, but it's then supported by the rigid structures on the outside, which allow for even more climbing. So quite a few kids can play on that at once. So that's pretty much my presentation. All right, thank you, Barb. Um, I just wanted to say I appreciate the that you allowed the kids to um, rank the separate play elements and what they were interested in. And also, I think I, I learned in a previous meeting from someone who spoke, or maybe she sent in a comment, but anyway, she was in early childhood education and um, apparently it's a good thing in a playground to have the structure for older children and then the structure for younger children. I mean, that way, yes. obviously, if you have a seven-year-old and a two-year-old, they can all enjoy the playground, so. Yeah, we received a, a, a lot of good information. I mean, you know, some of the, the features people were commenting that they wanted just, you know, they wanted a natural play space. That's just not the park for a, a natural type of um, playground. You know, it's just, we just don't have it there. There's not a creek running through. There's not a lot of, you know, it's just, not, it's just I, I love those too, but that, that particular location does not uh, fit that type of playground, obviously. But you'd be so, I, I almost included it in the presentation. After we took all of the, when the kids ranked the one through nine and we put it into a pie chart, I mean, those pie pieces were all so even. <laughs> it was interesting to see. It was, they're really, you know, slides was a big one. Tunnels was a, another pretty big one. Um, we couldn't really do a lot of tunnel, like the tunnels like you see over at Switchyard Park where you have the berm tunnels. We couldn't really do that here either, but. Um, but it, those pie, the pie chart was so even on what the kids, you know, what their pieces, favorite pieces were. So anyway. I'm sure they'll be very happy to have it since that's been yes. torn up over there for a while. So. Oh yeah. All right, great, thank you. Any um, questions for Barb before we move to a motion? Kath, Kathleen, we do yes. have uh, Catherine, uh, Kathy Deersing from the Project School is here. Oh, sure, okay, comment. yes. Kathy? Her hand is raised, Kim and Julie. Hi, uh, sorry, Paula. I wasn't I wasn't allowed to speak yet, so I think I'm I think I'm good there. Um, so I am Kathy Deersing, um, as Paula said, and I'm very um, pleased to be here this afternoon and grateful to the communication that has come from both Tim and Barb in the planning of this process and in including our 300 students um, in providing their input. Um, I am sure they all voted for the Dizzy Spinner Machine, which is perhaps my least favorite of playground attributes. But truthfully, outside of that, I love every other component um, that is in place in this proposal. So as many of you know, um, we have been um, in partnership with Parks and Recreation and they have served as our landlord since we opened our doors in 2009. This is our 13th year as a school and we are located on, on uh, 349 South Walnut Street um, and our second site is at, at 416 South Washington Street. 
So this truly is the neighborhood within which we exist. It is the place that we learn and grow and play together. And we were um, very honored in our second year as a school to take the lead on the Kaboom grant in partnership with Dave and with Parks and Recreation. Um, IU Health came in as the funder and provided 100 of the 200 volunteers. And I think Paula and I came up with the other 100. Um, and it, it, this also involved um, the Boys and Girls Club, the Lincoln Street Club. So I, I think I'd be remiss without mentioning them because they were also a part of that process. Um, and while Kaboom espouses building a playground in a day, um, that part is true. However, it's building a playground in a year um, through collaborative meetings and opportunities for input. And those were all done in partnership. So this park, uh, the Waldron Hill Buskirk Park means a great deal to us. And the playground felt like a part of um, the immediate community in which we're in partnership with. And so it was very important to us. So as you can imagine, when you think about the emotion that goes along with um, five Bradford pear trees and all that's connected to that, the emotion that went along with the playground disappearing uh, that had been there and that students who are here now remember their parents and grandparents. It is their version of Little House on the Prairie who built the Kaboom playground because they have all these memories that they've heard from other people about who showed up for the build. Um, so it was heartbreaking for them and it was very, very helpful and healing for them to then be asked for their perspectives and their opinions on what they really want wanted to have happen. So if we fast forward to um, just pre-COVID, which wasn't that long ago, we had a um, one of our multi-age classrooms, our five, six, seven classrooms, came to the city council to present and ask for a more inclusive playground structure and a more accessible playground structure with better universal design. It was their major project for that year, their problem project and place-based project for that year. And they had the city council chanting, inaccessible is unacceptable. And those students are now in eighth, ninth and 10th grade and will be so thrilled. And I'm sure will be present at any ribbon cutting because what you all have developed with Miracle Playgrounds and what's being proposed for today very much reflects what their concerns were. As one of their classmates who uses um, a wheelchair to be mobile shared with them when she arrived on the playground each day, she got her book out because she couldn't access any of the ways to play. They moved into action with their presentation. And what city council shared was that there was going to be a big change that would happen through the parks board um, and that they could look forward to some of the things that they had presented being included. And in fact, they are very much reflected in this proposal. So as a school community that is committed to partnering with local and community resources with Parks and Rec being very high on that list, we are very grateful and very excited for the proposal to the board this evening. So thank you for the opportunity to, to um, speak to it a bit. All right, thank you, Kathy. Are there any other public comments about this um, agenda item? Kathleen, not a public comment, maybe just a quick clarification. Sure. And, yeah. and, and thank you, Kathy. Um, Barb, your audio might have glitched, but it sounded like you said 44,000 and just want to make sure the approval memo is 244,000. It might have just oh, yeah. dropped off uh, there. Thanks. Yeah, two, 200, 244,000. Okay. All right. Great. All right. Um, so if we don't have any other raised hands or public comment, I think we're ready for a motion on this item C2. I move to approve the contract with Miracles for Waldron Hill and Buster Park Playground. And I'll second. All right. And a roll call, please, Kim, for those in favor. Kathleen Mills. Aye. Ellen Rodkey. Aye. Israel Herrera. Aye. And Jim Whitlatch. Aye. I couldn't find my unmute. But Thank I'm an you. Aye. Sorry. Okay. All right. Unanimously passed. Um, thank you, Barb. Thank you. And next, we'll move to Leslie Brinson to review the contract with Winterland Rentals. 
Good afternoon, Leslie Brinson, the Community Events Manager. I am here today to ask approval for a new service contract with a company named Winterland Inc. The staff recommends approval of a service contract with Winterland Inc. for the rental of light up structures for the new Winter Lights December Nights event to take place on December 10th and 11th at Switchyard Park. The fee for this contract is $5,184. Um, this is a new event that we are hosting at Switchyard Park. Um, during the winter event, uh, winter, during this event, Winterland will provide standalone light uh, fixtures to be displayed around the park, such things as reindeer, snowman, snowflakes, um, things of that sort. The department will rent the lights from Winterland who will deliver, set up, and then come back and pick up the lights after the event. And again, this is the first time working with this company, but we've been very pleased so far with the relationship and their willingness to help and answer lots of questions as we venture into this new, uh, new opportunity. You can see on the screen some information about the Winter Lights December Nights event. Um, an opportunity we hope for people to walk through the park and look at the lights. Uh, we'll have luminaries, um, different park, parts of the park will be lit up with both lights we have purchased in these winter land rental lights. And then on Saturday, we'll increase the activities with a fun run, a candy cane hunt, um, a dog themed uh, hunt for those canines, um, as well as some live entertainment and food and drinks. So, um, you know, starting kind of small this year, but really looking to build this event into something and the rental of these lights as opposed to us purchasing uh, seems much more uh, manageable in our in our budget. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, um, I guess just trying to get a sense of the size of the lighted items. Yes, they range anywhere from two feet, uh, a snowflake that might be two feet by four or five feet to as big as uh, five feet, six feet, eight feet tall structures. So we try to find a variety. If you give me a minute, I can pull up the list that we ordered, but um, yeah, so there'll be a variety of different sizes, different placements of these um, these objects or light up designs. And also, Leslie, I'm assuming that the company takes care of all of the, I mean, this sounds like a lot of running of cords and lighting. I don't know. They, they manage all of that and We'll be working. Um, we'll be working with them to find. We're, we're placing them in places where electricity is already existing in the park, so that cords won't have to be run too okay. far. We've uh, strategically placed them. Um, we have six different deer that range from three feet to six feet tall. A boy pulling a sled, which is five feet tall and seven feet wide. Um, snowflakes. A waving snowman and then a snowman that's gonna be like belly flopping down one of the berms. Um, so again, different different sizes, um, but but large. Uh, the largest one is eight feet tall and um, seven and a half feet wide. So fairly wow. large. Okay. But they do use just regular electricity. Right, yeah, okay. All right, thank you. This, this sounds, sounds really cool. Any um, other questions for Leslie about the Winterland rentals? Yeah, it sounds really neat. It's um, it'll be interesting to see, you know, I think how it goes, and hopefully we have really good attendance because it could be something that continues to grow. I just think of like um, other communities where they have these kinds of things set up for like a whole, you know, like few weeks, and it's kind of a whole community activity to go through them and stuff like that. So it'd be kind of neat to see over time if that grows and if. Um, you know, if we expand that in future years. Exactly. And, and, you know, hopefully we'll be able to expand the footprint as well. Right now, the footprint for the event will be fairly small around the pavilion, but as we, as it grows and as we, you know, look for different ways to involve community, whether that's providing their own structure or more financial so that we can rent more structures, but, you know, the, the big archways that you can walk through, and we've also purchased um, projections. So there'll be some lights that are projected that we've purchased internally, as well as different um, of like the hanging curtain lights and the different snowman lights and rope lights. So uh, I, we're hopeful that it'll be a good start. And you never know about December, but our fingers are crossed. Yeah. Okay. All right, great. Any other questions for Leslie? 
Yeah, I can move to approve the contract. Okay. Um, actually, sorry, Ellen, just for, let me see if there are any raised hands of public comment. Kathleen, I'd just like to um, give a shout out to the event sponsors. Um, it was on the, the flyer, but uh, Wendell, Ernstberger and Associates, and then um, locally CFC um, properties um, are helping with the sponsorship of, of this new event, which uh, uh, staff worked really hard to secure that because sometimes that happens. We create something in the middle of a budget year. So through their generosity, um, we are able to, to bring this event to the community. So I just wanted to give them a shout out and a public thank you. Okay. All right. Yes, very much appreciated. So then I think if we don't have any raised hands, um, then Ellen could go ahead and take a motion, please. Yes, I'll move to approve the contract for the Winter Wonderland. Second. Okay, and the roll call vote, please, Kim. Kathleen Mills. Aye. Ellen Rodkey. Aye. Israel Herrera. Aye. Jim Whitlatch. Aye. Thank you. Okay, motion is carried. Thank you, Leslie. And then we had a preview of the price schedule with division directors previously. And then, uh, then this afternoon, we'll have our, our chance for the approval, final approval of the price schedule. So Paula, are you gonna kick us off with this? Or? Yeah, so, okay. um, and, and uh, as you mentioned last month, uh, division directors presented the um, areas that uh, we'll see some uh, have proposed price increases. So um, what we have brought forward today is the final draft. There were no changes um, based on um, our presentation last month. Uh, division directors are present on this call. Uh, Becky is out today, but Leslie and um, Sean are available. If there are any last minute questions and clarifications before we ask for the formal um, approval of the 2022 price schedule. Okay. All right. And I, looking through it, um, I did not have any further questions or um, other board members have any questions or anything that needs to be clarified on the price schedule. No, thank you to the um, division directors last month for just on the overview. And I think, um, you know, it's just important for the public to know how much time goes into reviewing these things and the process that it goes through uh, because it's really thoughtful, um, and, you know, in um, making sure that we keep costs at the best place for the community members um, and for the department. Yes, that's a that's an important point. Yes, thank you, Ellen. Um, the, do we have any raised hands of um, public comment on the price schedule? It does not look like there are any. Okay. Elaine, so we should be good. Okay, thank you. So then we'll go ahead and take a motion on this item C4. I can move to approve. Okay, and a second. I second. Okay, and a roll call vote, please. Kathleen Mills. Aye. Ellen Rodkey. Aye. Israel Herrera. Aye. Jim Whitlatch. Aye. Thank you. Okay. Motion passes unanimously. And then we'll move into our section D for back to Tim Street for an update on the goat farm project. Good evening, Park Board, Tim Street, Operations and Development Division Director with Bloomington Parks. Uh, I'm going to take a chance tonight, since we have a little time on the agenda, and since we've had some developments lately with uh, Goat Farm, uh, to talk about how plans have been coming along uh, for that park. Um, you'll recall, well, and first of all, let me provide some name clarification. So the, the park as it stands is Goat Farm Park. Um, there was a donation that was received um, last December uh, to further develop the park, and as part of that donation, uh, the park will be renamed upon completion of the project to Rogers Family Park. So you may hear me um, use those terms interchangeably because I'm used to, to operating with the Rogers Family Park in mind. 
um, but it is still goat farm officially, you know, until we get to the end of the project. Um, so this, pro uh, this property was acquired by Parks back in 2007, um, and the Jackson Creek Trail was built through it shortly thereafter. Um, after the donation was received towards the tail end of last year, um, we went back to Mater Design, uh, who had made a master plan for the park uh, about eight years ago. I believe it was 2013 when this was speculated. Uh, Mater Design kind of dusted off the master plan, updated a few things um, from, from what had been conceptualized before, and we had a public meeting in April uh, to present the ideas. Um, to neighbors, to community, um, all of that. We received a, a lot of feedback, both in person from our in-person meeting. Uh, it was also hosted virtually. And we had a, a web form out there that our uh, community relations team created to, to gather and solicit feedback um, on the potential designs. So we received a lot of really good community feedback, um, took that into account, you know, and, and really started to look at the design and, and, and updating things from, from what had been done, you know, a number of years ago. Um, as well as to update things with the intent of what we wanted to do with the property um, and what it was donated to be. So, um, you know, I think we all really value this park as, um, sorry, my computer's trying to update. Hang on, remind me tomorrow. Um, I think we all really value this park as a unique space uh, in our system and even in our city uh, as open space, um, part of which has been returned to Native Prairie uh, through efforts in 2018, uh, the, the front part, the north part that's close to Rogers Road, Winslow Road. Um, and the intent for this park is really to, you know, preserve it as a natural space, preserve it as a passive space, um, increase access and accessibility um, to the amenities there, uh, increase trails and interaction with nature uh, and, and with the restored prairie. Uh, so, you know, we took some feedback into account um, from the previous iteration of plans uh, in, in these plans. Some of the major changes you'll notice from uh, the previous iteration include um, the parking has changed the location of that as well as sort of the central plaza area. And so let me, let me give you your bearings on this diagram first. So um, as you look at this to the right is north. Uh, so Winslow Road, Rogers Road and the roundabout are right off the right edge of the map, basically. Um, coming in off the bottom right corner, you can see the drive entry um, coming into the property. And then the Jackson Creek Trail runs diagonally all the way, which is basically south, southwest through the property and connects down to Sherwood Oaks Park. So just to kind of give you your bearings there. So um, one of the main things we changed since April is uh, the location of the parking. Uh, so parking will be permeable pavers. Um, to basically make sure we're being responsible with stormwater and um, decreasing the permeable surface as much as possible. That has shifted um, around to the north to be much closer to the roundabout entrance. Um, this accomplishes a few things. One, it, it does move those cars away from some of the houses in Benton Court to the west. Uh, and it does decrease the amount of distance that, that cars would need to drive into the, into the park to park. Um, there's 10 parking places. We'll, we'll zoom in on this in a second. Actually, Kim, if you go ahead two slides, we can take a look since we're talking about this. Um, so our bearings here have shifted. So now north is up and the roundabout is just off the top right. Uh, so 10 parking places with permeable pavers. This is kind of between, there's a little ditch line in the existing road, uh, four of which would be accessible. Uh, this increases access to this park. One of the things we hear a lot is that, and, and quite frankly, we see a lot is that people who don't necessarily live right next door um, do want to experience this park because it is unique. Uh, we see people parking just off the roundabout a lot of the time. And so this will increase the safety, um, giving those people a place to park and enjoy the park. And we'll also create a trailhead right there um, to experience the, the multi-use trail that's gonna run down through the prairie. Um, you can see we've integrated some limestone blocks here. That's to make sure no one's able to drive out into the prairie. Um, and then at the left side, there'll be a gate at the end of the parking to prevent people from continuing to drive further into the park. Um, one of the things we'll be able to solve too is uh, finally connecting. If you're familiar with the path down there, when you get back to the gate, the two paths going around don't quite connect. And so you have to kind of step through the grass. Um, this will solve that as well. So Kim, if you could go back to slides for me. 
Um, so again, this is the overall view. Um, one of the things we're also going to do is the, the part that's sort of cross-hatched in yellow in the middle um, is our anticipated expansion of native prairie. Uh, we intend to use the same seed mix as the front, basically third or quarter of the field, uh, which was nativized in 2018. Um, you know, a lot of people don't realize looking at it, it does kind of all look like it's just prairie, but only that, that front, that northern third has actually been converted back to natives. So there's a lot of other, uh, speaking of calorie pears, there's calorie pears growing in there. Um, there's teasel, there's a lot of other invasive species. So um, including, you know, this nativization is, is a big part of, you know, honoring what I think this park is about and uh, making sure it's got plenty of space for wildlife and to support the native flora and fauna. Uh, the trail running through the middle will connect down towards the south. Um, towards that end, uh, we will finish the overall loop um, going down towards the south. Um, there's a, a brown section, a uh, light tan section as you kind of work your way down that trail to the south, Kim, if you're pointing um, up, up and follow that trail where the new paving is gonna connect down to the south, there's a lighter section that's gonna be boardwalk. There's a really marshy area um, along the woods edge there. Um, so that will be completed so people can do this as a loop. Uh, and then Kim, if you can go forward one slide. There we go. Um, the sort of central plaza area, we've, we've shifted from the north side of the barn to bring it around to the east side. Um, this does pull things away a little bit from the neighborhood, um, but also takes advantage of the existing overhang on the barn, um, integrates the barn into the design a little bit more. Uh, so we'll have the barn, we'll have just a, a small central sort of mode space, um, <clears throat> a very small picnic shelter for a couple picnic tables um, over to the left and then a shade pergola on the right. So the idea again is not, this is not a big gathering space. This is not a reservable shelter. Uh, it's not sports fields. It's not lights. There's, there's no lights involved anywhere. Uh, it's very much a passive park meant to, um, you know, give, give people and families more options to visit the park, to, to rest and relax in the park um, without creating a really big impact. Uh, so we're, we're really happy with how this has gone. We had another uh, public open house on November 1st. Uh, we actually did it out at the barn and, and had a pretty good crowd of, of neighbors and passerbys um, stop in and, and check on the plans. Uh, still got a little bit more feedback, but overall, we're very pleased with how that went um, and are, are looking forward to moving this forward. So um, where we are at with this now is uh, we are working on developing construction documents with major design. Uh, that'll probably occur over the next few months here over the winter uh, and then hope it, Hopefully in you know, somewhat early 2022, uh, we start the bid process um, to, to get the rest of this built out. So um, I think I've hit all the major points I wanted to hit, but i um, happy to take feedback or questions on the plans. Okay, thanks, Tim. I'm sorry, I just had to let out. You know what, I did forget one other thing I wanted to mention. Yeah. The, the barn is such a key central part of this uh, and the, the donors have agreed that um, Upon completion of a, of a structural inspection, um, they are going to look at a potential further donation to restore the siding and roof uh, and paint job of the silo uh, to, to keep that preserved as part of the iconic nature of this park as well. So we are currently working on that. That is not going to be part necessarily. It's not part of what major design is taking on as part of the park build. Um, that's something we're just running separately through the department. Okay. Well, yes, that, that is part of the whole but one of the striking visual things that you notice when you drive past there. So thank you for those details. And also I like the, the idea of something that's, that's very natural, that, um, you know, it's, it's very different from Switchyard Park, but has a lot of interesting attributes on its own. So yeah, thank you for that, that update. That's going to be exciting to, to see as it progresses. So any other um, parks board Questions for Tim or comments? No, thanks, Tim. I think it's um, it's been great to watch this kind of go along and lucky to have, you know, philanthropic community members that want to invest in our parks in this way and see the value in that. And um, likewise, that we have active participation in the neighborhoods, 
to um, that they also see it as a value as well. Thanks. All right. Thank you all. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Do and um, thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have any raised hands about this item, um, Kim? No, it does not look like we do. Okay. All right. Thank you then. And then we'll go back over to Paula to tell us about anything upcoming or. Uh, yes, before we do that, do you just want to yes. ask if there's any uh, public comment um, for uh, the last part of our agenda for anything? That oh, yes. Not yeah. Presented? Sorry, I was at. Yeah, I asked specifically about the goat farm, but not about. Yes, if there's any other raised hands or Facebook comments or emailed comments. Nothing in my email. Okay. No raised hands. Okay. Gosh, Paula, you're the only person who's ever been able to utter the phrase nothing in my email. I mean, we know what you mean. I know. What a, what a, what a phrase there, that There is be. something in my email. But it's not, <laughs> it's not, not a public this. comment. Let me okay. Tell you. okay. <laughs> no, that would be the day, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, I want to thank uh, our staff, and it, it was great to give uh, Tim the opportunity to present where we are with the goat farm project. It's uh, been um, a busy couple months um, with that project, so that was exciting to be able to share that uh, with you. Um, just a couple of things on my end. I want to uh, give a, a shout out for um, the department, specifically in urban forestry who uh, received the uh, Excellence in Resource Improvement Award um, from our Indiana Park and Recreation Association at our annual conference uh, held two weeks ago now. And that was for the Davy Tree Canopy Tree Keeper, how we are now managing uh, the trees and uh, status of our trees um, in the city. And that was recognized as an improvement in how we are managing the resources. Um, and then Switchyard Park received the Exceptional Facility Award for the pavilion at Switchyard Park. So that was um, very rewarding. And then our very own uh, now retired Nick Renison, former Parks Director, received the IPRA Lifetime Achievement Award. So very exciting there. Um, we, as you can tell, we've got a lot on the horizon. We've turned the dial for um, into to winter program. So we're very excited about that. We have holiday market coming up here to wrap up the holiday season right after um, Saturday after Thanksgiving. So looking forward to that. And um, we're meeting again for our final uh, park board meeting of 2021. Um, that meeting will be held December 7th, doing it a little bit earlier uh, to accommodate some schedule conflicts and that. So um, staff are already working on those partnerships and, and contracts and preparation to wrap up the year um, on December 7th. And that is all I have from my end. Okay, well, thank you and well-deserved on the, the three awards for department members and for the department in general. So congratulations on those and thank you. Thank you to- Thank you all for your time. Staff. Yes, thank you. And we'll see you in just a couple of weeks. All right, and with that, our November meeting of the Bloomington Board of Park Commissioners is adjourned.